Carissa Rashidi uh, from the University of Florida. Dr. Rashidi is the founding co-director of the Intelligent Critical Care Center at the University of Florida and an assistant professor at the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, she is also affiliated with the Electrical and Computer Engineering and Computer and Information Science and Engineering Departments. Her research aims to uh, bridge the gap between machine learning and patient care. Dr. Rashidi is a National Science Foundation Career Awardee, the National Institute of Health Trailblazer Awardee, Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering Leadership Excellence Awardee, Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering Assistant Professor Excellence Awardee, and a recipient of the University of Florida Term Professorship. She is also a recipient of University of Florida's Provost Excellent Award for Assistant Professors. Uh, with more than 500 tenure track assistant professors at the University of Florida, Dr. Rashidi is one of only 10 to receive this award. She was invited by the National Academy of Engineering as one of only 38 outstanding U.S. engineers under 45 to participate in the EU-U.S. Frontiers of Engineering meeting. To date, she has authored more than 170 peer-reviewed publications and she has chaired six workshops and symposiums on intelligent health systems and has served on the program committee of more than 20 conferences. Dr. Rashidi's research has been supported by local, state, and federal grants, including awards from the National Institute of Health and the National Science Foundation. Dr. Rashidi, thank you very much for being with, with us today. We are really excited to uh, to hear your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And thanks everyone for attending this talk and uh, listening to this talk. Um, I apologize in advance if my voice is a little bit hoarse and sometimes there might be ups and downs as I was explaining to Amir. Uh, I got some virus, uh, respiratory virus, uh, which is not COVID, but very similar to COVID. So. <clears throat> All right, uh, today I will be talking about intelligent uh, critical care and some of the opportunities and challenges that exist, especially if you are going to use uh, some of the emerging technologies such as pervasive sensing and artificial intelligence in the intensive care unit. So I will talk about some of the topics, I will provide an overview, and then uh, I will explain some of the projects that we have been working on. This is a slide that I usually like to start my talks with. I created this to kind of show the history of AI in a visual manner. Um, and it kind of tells us how we have come a long way from the early days of AI with a single layer of neurons in the 40s, in the 1940s, all the way to the multi-million and sometimes multi-billion parameter models of today that we have, such as the large transformer model that many of us these days are using in different contexts. And it has been very exciting because nowadays, not only we see the theoretical aspects uh, emerging, but also we see many applications of AI in many fronts, in many domains, including in the medical domain, uh, which is my own domain, and that is very exciting to me. Now, in terms of the applications of AI in medicine, there are many applications, of course. We can name <clears throat> clinical decision support systems, diagnosis aid, prognosis predict prediction, uh, all the variable sensors that we can use, and uh, we need AI in order to process all of the information, the rich contextual information that is coming from those devices. Robotic, <coughs> sorry robotic surgery, and many other applications. So there is a plethora of applications that we can name that can use AI or have the potential to use AI. The same can be said about commercial progress in AI. 
not only AI research has progressed a lot in recent years in terms of academic research, but we also have seen quite some progress in terms of commercial progress and translation of AI application from just research setting into clinical setting. For example, here what you see is just a number of algorithms based on a new database uh, that shows the recent uh, models that are in the FDA approval process. Now, many of them are not just in the critical care setting. They might refer to oncology, radiology, some of the other adjacent fields, but it kind of shows the progress and how AI is moving from just being a research interest into being in a, applied in a more translational setting, in the clinical setting, and that is a very important step. The use of AI in critical care is also expanding uh, beyond generally in medicine, the use of AI in critical care. Every day we see many papers being published and it, as you might know, it's even difficult to keep up with all of these papers. There are papers, for example, that use AI for sepsis prediction based on structure and unstructured data using AI for improving kidney care. That's one of the papers that we had with my colleague. <clears throat> for example, for acute kidney uh, care, uh, especially in the ICU, that can be uh, the infections, the AKI infection, those can be a huge issue. And in general, uh, AI is finding its way into many fronts in critical care. And I think that in the long term, what we would see is AI augmented healthcare systems. And that basically means that we will have systems that are not replacing uh, physicians or nurses, but are augmenting their decision making progress, a uh, process, especially in settings that might not be as critical. Still, we will have, of course, humans in the loop for critical decision making but some of the low level repetitive and also the routine tasks will be uh, replaced by um, those systems. Now, in terms of um, the projects that we have been working on, I wanna give you, uh, I wanna provide a showcase of several of the projects that we are working on. And uh, I will start with the first one we call it as Intelligent ICU. Uh, I want to acknowledge NSF and NIH that have been <clears throat> supporting this research and also many people who have been working on this. The uh, first topic that I want to talk about is acuity assessment and how we can use AI, machine learning in general for that. So the motivation for this task was if you go to an ICU room, you see a patient, can you ask the doctor, how sick is this patient? Give me a number. Now, for those of you who might not be physicians, that might sound like, well, that might not be too hard, but it is actually a very difficult and challenging task uh, because patients who are staying in the ICU, they usually suffer from multiple organ dysfunctions and it would be very difficult to provide a score that can tell you how sick they are. And this score actually can be very important because it can help you in trajectory monitoring, whether over time, if the score is improving, if they, they, it shows they are improving, if it's declining, it shows they are declining. We can use that also for clinical resource allocation, which is very important. We have seen that during COVID era, that if you want to triage patients, we need a score, we need a criteria. So in the past, there have been a number of scores, manual scores that have been developed. For example, the sequential organ failure assessment or SOFA score, the Apache score, and there are many of uh, such scores that are being used in uh, the clinical routine care. Now, to show you one of those, this is the SOFA score. <laughs> The SOFA score is basically based on six organ systems and 13 different variables that you see here. <clears throat> Respiration, coagulation, the nervous system, cardiovascular, liver, renal, and for each one of those, you have a number of variables that you can measure. 
And typically, the worst measurement of the day, for example, for the mean arterial pressure, is used. Uh, Uh, hello, uh, can I believe that uh, Dr. Rashidi is disconnected? Can can someone in the audience? Hello, hi, Dr. Yeah. Rashidi. For I, I think for uh, a few seconds you were disconnected. I, I'm sorry. Yes, please continue. Okay. Uh, did you see this uh, slide? I can repeat this slide. Yes, yeah. Uh, oh, this new slide, yeah, I, I, I appreciate if you repeat this sequential organ failure assessment. Yeah, sure. So, as I was uh, saying, um, SOFA score is based on the variables and organ systems. And for each one of those organ system and variables, uh, there are thresholds that are being used. For example, for the FIO2 or some of the other measures, you have certain thresholds. And based on that, you can assign a score from 0 to 4. Once you get those scores for all of the variables, sum them up, and then you get the overall score. Now, based on looking at the score in a sequential manner, you can say if there is a chance of mortality or not, as you can see here. Now, the problem is that uh, this is a single SOFA score that is provided to you. It is computed manually every 24 hours only once. And even then it's based on the worst measurement of the day. So you're throwing out everything else. You're only looking at the worst blood pressure. But as we know in the ICU, the patients, they it's a very fast paced environment in just a matter of 24 hours, a lot can happen. There might be many things that go up and down, many of their vital signs, and so a lot can change in between. So we decided that we can maybe use all of the data. Why well, throw away all of the data? <clears throat> and if we can use all of the data that already is being collected in the IC, we can use that in order to compute the SOFA score in a continuous manner but this time probably more accurate. And that's what we did. We used uh, a deep learning network, we used self-attention, and it's kind of based on the transformer models. And um, what you see here is the actual data based on an actual patient that shows at the beginning, the model is predicting everything being well, and then over time, as the time progresses based on all the information that is provided to the model, it realizes that, oh, well, you know, it's not going so well. So that's why you see the yellow <clears throat> color coding. And if you also look here at this plot that you see on the right hand side, there is a blue line that is on top and then there is a gray line that is at the bottom. The bottom gray line shows the clinical SOFA score. This is for a patient. This is the chance of mortality for a patient that unfortunately passed away. So you can see that the chance of mortality based on clinical score that is used in practice, it's very low. Even towards the very end still, it's less than 50% chance of mortality. So based on this information, there is no way that the doctors can intervene because the chance of mortality is not predicted the right way. Based on our model, from the very beginning, the chance of mortality is much higher. And actually, as we get towards the end hours, it is 99% sure. Now, this is, of course, just for one patient, but uh, even if for one patient, you can do something, that's a lot. So this is a study that we did uh, with more than uh, 70,000 um, patients, <clears throat> and it was externally validated. We have done similar studies also for other tasks, uh, for example, for predicting other outcomes in the intensive care unit, mortality, not just in the hospital, but within 
seven days, 30 days, 90 days, one year readmission. We also have done uh, the same thing with uh, surgical uh, complications. And in all of those models, uh, we see that when we are using additional data, and when we are using those models that can use and utilize all the data, we get better performance and we get uh, better uh, prediction models. So this one is for predicting post-operative complications, a number of post-operative complications, such as risk of sepsis, delirium, acute kidney injury, uh, and a, a number of others, such as the risk of uh, <clears throat> uh, mechanical ventilation that is prolonged. Again, uh, same story using all the data and uh, models that are more accurate, it can help in prediction. Now, I wanna switch gears a little bit here, and I wanna talk about other forms of data that we are not collecting in the ICU or we are collecting in a manual manner, so it's not accessible to our models. Those can include many things such as, for example, physical function. We know that physical function of the patients in the ICU is very important. Their mobility is a very good indicator of how they are recovering in the ICU, but we don't have a very good measure of that typically uh, in an automated way. The nurses, they usually go into the ICU room every four hours for every patient, they have scores that they uh, use in order to score mobility of the patient, like if they are able to take a couple of steps, if they are able to sit upright, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> the same goes for pain. Uh, most patients in the IC, they cannot talk, they are not verbal. So the nurses have to use scores that are for nonverbal patients. They have to observe certain facial muscles and also their behavior. And for each one of the items on their score list, they add a score, add them up, and then based on that, you get a score that tells you uh, patient's pain is eight on a scale of zero to 10. Now, as you can imagine, those are manual. So basically it means that those overburdened nurses, they have to do a lot. They are already doing a lot, but every four hours they have to do those manual uh, observations for every single patient. It's subjective, as we know. Uh, humans can add to the variability in results. So <clears throat> depending on who is observing, who is being observed, and many other factors, the results might not be the same if you repeat the same experiment. And of course, this is not continuous. The nurses go into the ICU room of each patient for five minutes, they observe the patient, and then they have to move on to the next patient. So the patients are not being observed all the time. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and then there are also other information that we are not capturing at all. <coughs> Some of this information includes, for example, sleep. We are not capturing any information about sleep. Uh, that can be related to delirium, for example, because we know that when uh, patients' um, uh, sleep cycle is disturbed, then um, it can result in conditions such as delirium. So that can be very difficult to measure nowadays, but those are very important, in fact. Same goes for loud background noise, excessive visitations. Uh, many patients in the middle of the night, they are waking up <clears throat> to give them some medications or to perform some procedures. But again, that changes their circadian rhythm. <coughs> so to capture this kind of information, we collected data from about uh, 200 patients and for doing that, we are using different types of sensors that you can see here. Uh, we are using variable sensors for EMG data collection, for accelerometry data collection, as well as <clears throat> different types of cameras, such as depth camera and RGB for capturing activity and 
pain expressions of the patients. And also we have IoT sensors that can capture some of the environmental information such as noise, light level, and other information. What you see here is the actual system that we use in the ICU room. And we put that at the back of the room towards uh, the wall to avoid disrupting the clinical uh, care routine. Um, so <clears throat> there are a lot of design consideration that actually need to be considered here. And I will talk about some of those. Once uh, we capture information, and that basically means um, the information that is related to depth, uh, RGB, as well as also the accelerometry data, then uh, we can uh, use this information in many ways. For example, for detecting visitation patterns, activity of the patients, and what you see here is actually uh, my students, of course. The ICU patients, they will not be moving so quickly, but this is just for demonstration purpose. We develop many computer vision techniques in order to be able to detect patients' activities, number of people in their room, and so on and so forth. One interesting uh, fact that we found out is that it's actually very loud also in the ICU. Sometimes it's street traffic level, which is not good at all for conditions such as delirium. We also found out that the visitation patterns for delirious patients <clears throat> is very interesting, such that they get more visitations at night. And then during the day, they don't have as many visitations, basically, they don't have as much socialization to reorient them. And that creates a vicious loop that uh, unfortunately can exacerbate their delirious uh, status. So in a recent R01 that we have received from <clears throat> National Institute of Health, we are looking at ways um, not only to predict delirium based on environmental factors and based on also patient clinical history, but we are also looking into how uh, providing prompts to the nurses, caregivers, uh, to kind of change the environment if needed. And in this uh, new project, we are also looking at some of the biomarkers for circadian rhythm of the patients based on um, the blood biomarkers. And that is very interesting. This is one of the first studies that uh, is looking at the relation between uh, circadian rhythm data based on sensor data, based on environmental factor, as well as biomarkers data. Now, one thing that I want to mention in all of these studies is that sometimes as uh, AI researchers, and I'm guilting myself uh, here, uh, we tend to think that, you know, the AI or machine learning model, it's the main part of the system. And although these days we have a lot of talk about ML ops and importance of ML ops, but really it's in practice that when you're developing these systems, you realize how important are the other parts, not just the machine learning part. And here you can see the <clears throat> pipeline of our uh, system. Um, we collect a lot of uh, clinical data from Shans Hospital, uh, and that goes uh, through uh, some of the uh, EPIC uh, pre-processing through Capsule, and then we capture that at our own server in real time. We also uh, combine that with some of the other information, such as the information that we are collecting from our pervasive sensing data. And then each one of the blocks that you see here are one system on its own. For example, the pervasive sensing data pipeline, here you can see the enlarged version of that, that <clears throat> there are many components for cleaning data, pre-processing that, and uh, for annotation. Annotation is a huge part of our models, and we put a lot of effort into that. As well as for uh, making sure that there is enough security, that the privacy of all the patients is preserved. So really, if you look at the overall pipeline, there is a lot of work that is being put into the overall system and not just the machine learning piece. Now, um, you might say, okay, well, you're collecting clinical data. You're also cl collecting sensing data, pervasive sensing data. Why not put them together and see how 
much better uh, predictions you can get. We actually did that. Uh, this is based on one of our pilot studies. And now we have more patients and we are planning to do the uh, analysis again based on more uh, patient uh, data. <clears throat> But back then, when we looked at the uh, results of integrating sensing and clinical data, we realized that for predicting something such as even like a mortality, once you combine them together, you see a boost in performance. It might not be very significant, like we jump from 0.86 to 0.90 for our patients, but still it is a boost. And that's not surprising because as we know, mobility is very important indicator of recovery in the ICU. <clears throat> so that kind of makes sense. All right, now I have talked about clinical data using that for predictions, how we can add pervasive sensing data, including mobility and physical function. The next thing that I wanna talk a little bit about is cognitive function. Cognitive function is also very important especially in older adults who are undergoing surgery. And we actually have seen, there are several studies that show that cognitive function of older adults who undergo surgery before and after, it changes. Whether it is because of the anesthetic agents or because of something else, we still don't understand the whole mechanism very well, but it happens. <clears throat> that can snowball into a uh, cognitive quick cognitive function decline. So in this study, which was done with my colleague, Dr. Catherine Price, she is the uh, PI for collecting data uh, at UF. We looked into how we can measure cognitive function of patients, older adult patients who are in the ICU, in the hospital <clears throat> and undergoing surgery. There is a uh, test, cognitive function test, test uh, that is called the clock test, clock drawing test or CDT. And it's very simple. Basically, you ask patients to either copy a clock or to draw that from memory and set the hands to, for example, 10 after 2. Again, it sounds very simple, but you would be surprised how much can it can tell you. Even, for example, if they are missing a hook in one of the digits, it can tell you a lot about spatial memory, uh, executive function, language, and many other aspects of uh, cognitive function. It has been documented. <clears throat> Even something such as if they are not drawing a complete circle and part of the clock face is missing, that can tell you a lot. Now, the problem is that so far, these clocks, uh, they had to be uh, scored manually and people had to be trained in order to score them which is difficult, which is time consuming. So we said, well, let's do it automatically. Let's see if we can do it automatically using computer vision techniques. And that's what we did. We are using uh, deep learning techniques, different types of deep learning techniques that we have been using over years. Uh, what you see here, for example, is based on a <clears throat> factor VAE. Um, and we are using the uh, VAE objective function uh, that can fine tune the importance of KL divergence and also uh, take into account the mutual information between the input and the code. And based on that, it can find out what are some of the latent factors here for, e for those clocks. We had collected 23,000 clocks so far. And what we realized is that in all of these clocks, there are a number of factors that based on our unsupervised, semi-supervised approach we see, such as the size of the clocks seem to be very important in determining the ultimate cognitive function score, irregularity, whether it's avocado shaped or complete circle, uh, the distance uh, of the hands to the geometry center, <clears throat> the angle between hands, whether it's correct or not. So those are all very interesting factors that we found out automatically, actually. And it corresponds well, very well, in many cases to the existing literature. This has been published and we are also in the process of, this was published this year, <clears throat> a couple of months ago, and we are also in the process of uh, 
uh, a new publication based on a new model that we are developing. Now, uh, the final piece that I want to point out to you is a new study, another new study that we have started with my uh, colleagues from um, Aging Institute. And this one is not in inpatient setting, but it is in outpatient setting. So we are collecting all of this data in the inpatient setting. We can monitor the patients, but what about after they get discharged? What happens after that? <clears throat> And in this study, that is what we are doing. We are using smartwatches in order to collect data from older adults who are discharged after surgery and they go home. Uh, after surgery, typically they get like two visits and they might be also called by the nurses to see how well they are doing, but that's it. Uh, their mobility, their recovery process, and many other information is not collected in real time. In this study, we decided to look into how we can incorporate the data from smartwatches into EPIC, which is the electronic health record system that we are using here at the University of Florida and also in many other places. And one of the questions that we had was, okay, well, we know that we can collect data. Uh, we already had a uh, platform that is collecting data in real time and sending that to our servers and we are in the process of integrating that with EPIC. But the question is that what form of data would be helpful to physicians? So we went back to square one and we did many uh, structure on structure interviews with the physicians, with the nurses, and we are still doing that actually to better understand what are their needs? Do they even want such a solution? And it turns out that they want such a solution based on the papers that also you see here. That's what the preliminary result shows us. They want such a solution, but also the presentation of data is very important. What measurements are presented to them is also very important. And <clears throat> this is an ongoing study, so we are still working on this, but I think that uh, that's the future of healthcare that uh, not only we are collecting clinical data, but also the data, patient-generated health data, will be also going back to the doctors and will not just stay with the patients. So that can be used in making decisions in their healthcare. Okay, so that was an overview of some of the projects that we have been doing in my lab and in collaboration also with my colleagues. Um, now, I want to point to some of the challenges that exist and how we can address them. In terms of the variable sensors, uh, there are many translational challenges that I can tell you. Uh, some of those are simple, like the battery power. <clears throat> when we were recruiting patients in the ICU, uh, they, uh, we had three clinical coordinators that would uh, recruit the patients to screen them, recruit them, uh, handle the equipment. Uh, but there's always a problem that the equipment, they also the variable sensors, they run out of battery. If you are using, for example, something like an Apple Watch, <clears throat> you have to recharge that. So it becomes a logistic issue. And a logistic issue is device position. How do you position those devices? We decided to position one on the wrist, one on the um, uh, arm, and one on the ankle initially to see which one of those position would be better. Because as we have seen in some of our previous work that you see here, uh, depending on where you place a sensor such as accelerometer, the results can be very different. And then in many cases in the ICU, those positions will not be exactly the same as you initially thought because the nurses will be uh, doing some procedures on the patients. Sometimes they have to take off the sensors and put that back. <clears throat> Many times they forget to put the sensors back. So in reality, you get a lot of data that is not as clean as it would be in a controlled setting. For some patients, they might not be even able to have a sensor at the non-dominant hand because they might have bandage, they might have other medical equipment. So 
all of these logistic issues, although seem simple, they can add to the data cleaning process, data analysis process down the road. Then there is the challenge of data annotation. In order to identify what a patient is doing or their pain level, we had to train annotators. And of course, this is something that cannot be outsourced to mechanical Turk because of patient privacy. Especially for uh, facial pain expression uh, annotation, it's very difficult because the annotators have to be trained for almost three months in order to be able to do it correctly based on a manual that exists. And it becomes also very tricky. Which frames do you sample? We are collecting data 24 seven for up to seven days, but when do you sample it? Uh, if it's before the nurse comes in, we don't have actually a very good idea when the nurse comes in, uh, when actually they ask the patient. And even so, there might not be a very good correlation between the pain score that the nurse is documenting and the frame number 23, for example, because it's very dynamic, it changes. So then you have annotation fatigue, you have the priming, and overall it's a very time consuming task. It's not like ImageNet that you can just send it out to thousands of people and ask them to annotate that. It is a lot more challenging. In terms of model development, you have the same types of challenges because the standard models do not work in the ICU. For example, activity recognition models do not work in the ICU because many times the patients will be in a pose uh, that they might be sleeping under the blankets, they might be sitting upright in a bed, but <clears throat> none of the existing data sets, they have this kind of information or data. So you cannot really use pre-training as much. The same goes for facial pain expression recognition because the patients might have oxygen masks, they might have oxygen tubes, uh, it might be obstructed, the face might be obstructed, the scene might be obstructed, and also they are far away from the camera. It's a non-frontal view. Everything becomes a lot more difficult. And of course, looking at the grand scheme of things, going beyond just pervasive sensing or AI, <clears throat> I think that in the future, what we need to do is that we need to go beyond prediction and we need to more focus on decision making. This is something that will happen as our AI models are maturing. And uh, we need to also think more about data sharing. How do we do data sharing? For example, <coughs> sorry, federated learning might be an approach. Um, <coughs> <coughs> Uh, my apologies. Um, federated learning might be an approach to be able to train on data from multiple institutions while um, not sharing data with other institutions. So that's another thing that in some of our recent grants we have been focusing on. Uh, and then you have also the issue of interpretability. Even if you have all of these data, how do you make sure that uh, those make sense? Even the all of the interpretive reality models that we have, they usually have been built for developers, for people who are working on deep learning models, not for end users. <clears throat> so those all become very interesting questions that I think we have to answer in the future. In terms of going beyond prediction, I think that reinforcement learning is one area that uh, we need to focus on. And we have been looking into that to some extent, but that is something that is quite challenging because it, it is one thing to uh, develop uh, reinforcement learning on an Atari game. And it's another thing when you're dealing with actual patients in the ICU. Uh, in terms of federated learning model, uh, right now we are working with uh, a number of uh, other sites to develop a federated learning model so we can integrate data, <clears throat> uh, get uh, data without sharing to develop a model based on federated learning. So that is another new front that we are working on uh, that we are hopeful that will be uh, very important for the future. 
And ultimately, I think that in the future, what we will see in the hospitals, it will be hospitals that are using AI and pervasive sensing almost everywhere, from the labs to physical therapy rooms to operating room to admission rooms, and also in the larger community itself for monitoring patients uh, after they get discharged, for monitoring even healthy adults who are moving around and about in the community and uh, to see uh, how we can help them with their health and well-being. So I think the future is going to be bright. There will be lots of challenges that we need to address. Of course, we are still at the beginning of the day and um, there will be many challenges in terms of ethical issues, in terms of the technical challenges, translational challenges that we have to address. But at the same time, it's very exciting uh, to be working on all of this. And um, <clears throat> I think um, as long as we have questions that need to be answered, uh, there is a lot of room for doing research uh, and uh, for everyone to contribute to this field as a community. So that's all that I have. Uh, thanks again for listening to my talk and sorry that I have been coughing a lot. Uh, uh, there were some disruptions, uh, but I welcome any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rashidi, despite your uh, sickness or uh, the medical condition. Thank you very much for giving us such a great talk. Uh, let me uh, just say something about the question, uh, question and uh, answer sessions. You can, if you have any questions, either you can send me that question, and then I can ask from Dr. Rashidi, or you can unmute uh, and ask your question directly. So, any questions from Dr. Rashidi? Okay, so let let me start with uh, with one of uh, my questions here. So from this last last slide, actually, that you are now presenting, uh, one of the questions that I have just for all of the uh, different projects, very nice projects that you discussed, and I personally enjoyed very much. Uh, is that usually when we are in clinical facilities among clinicians, sometimes there is a resistance or there is a mistrust uh, among clinicians or the cl clinical uh, crew about AI. Some of them, they say that it's a black box. We don't know how the uh, decision is made. Uh, what what do you think about that? Where are where are we? When can we think of, uh, you know, a, a scenario that we have an AI uh, decision making algorithm that also the clinicians can trust? When can we get to that point? And how far we are from that day? Great question, and I completely agree with you. <clears throat> uh, I think that. Right now, we have two probably different groups of clinicians. There are clinicians that uh, are actively working with AI researchers. And <clears throat> one of my colleagues, that close colleagues, that has been collaborating with me uh, on these projects, I would put her in that category. So, for some of those who are closer to the field, they understand the need for incorporating AI, and they might be more comfortable for accepting some of the pitfalls of AI and at the same time understand that it's not perfect. <clears throat> understand also the dangers and also the uh, shortcomings of AI. <clears throat> then we have uh, the other group that might be more doing clinical practice and therefore might not be exposed to AI on a daily basis in a research setting. And I think that for them, definitely we need to do a lot more work as I mentioned, uh, the interpretability models that we have that are working for deep learning models these days, most of them are developed for somebody who understands deep learning and are not actually easy to provide informative 
uh, pieces of information to uh, clinicians or nurses, it would be very difficult. And I think that one thing that we need to do is that we need to actually run usability studies, more usability studies along with developing those usability models, uh, usability techniques, and see, uh, not usability, interpretability techniques and see which one works for the doctors and also go back to square one ask them what information would you need if you wanted to use such a model what would you need in order to trust the model so i think that sometimes as uh, ai researchers machine learning researchers we do not go back to interviewing and doing usability studies with the uh actual user group with the stakeholders, but that is something that needs to be done. And in terms of the actual techniques, I think that still we have a long way to come. <clears throat> we already have developed models such as the different types of different flavors of transformer models that have billions of parameters, but can we really explain them? Can we really trust the results? I don't think we are there yet. So we need to have a lot of safeguards in place in order to use these models in practice. And that's why I say for now, and even in the short term, in the near future, those models will be used for augmenting decision-making process of physicians, but we cannot hope right now, or even in the near future, like five or 10 years, that they will be replacing anything. So that's my view. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so, is there any question on, if, if there is any question, uh, let's, uh, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Otherwise, I would like to ask a second follow up question from Dr. Rashidi. Any questions? Okay, then uh, I, I have one, one more question here. Uh, uh, so, for, for some of the applications that you showed today, such as the pain expression prediction, mm -hmm. uh, so, or maybe it, it, it's also applicable to other signals. Uh, is there any way to account for intersubject and intrasubject variability. Let's say, for example, there is some sort of facial expression today that you that it says something about the pain for patient A, and then tomorrow a different type of facial expression uh, should, in reality, gives you the same score. So, how how is it? Uh, is it a is it a challenge that should be addressed, or how, how much data do we need to uh, train our models to account for uh, that type of you know intersubject and intrasubject variabilities? First question, and um, yes, definitely we need to do that. I think that most of the models that so far we have been developing are generic models. We train it on the data from all the subjects, and although we train and test based on subject uh still uh for we have looked at actually that for people with different skin tones and how well the model works and we realize similar to what we have seen for example based on seminal work from uh timnit gibru if you have been following her work we have seen that for individuals who are african-american or female our models do not work as well. And that can go back to the fact that uh, the population that we have, the data that we have collected, <clears throat> uh, the percentage of uh, individuals from underrepresented minorities, as well as also the data sets that we are using for pre-training. So I think definitely we need to take that into consideration. Right now, what we are doing is that we are recruiting, we are specifically targeting to recruit from different uh, groups so that we have a better representation in our data sets. But even beyond that, even as you say, within one individual, uh, the pain expressions can change. Even it can change from day to day. And I think that in such cases, once we have a 
model that is working well for general population, the next step would be to do zero shot training and few shot training in order to kind of even personalize to each person in a much better way. So that might be the way uh, to address this problem. Uh, but definitely, you're absolutely right. Uh, that's something that needs to be addressed. Thank you so much. Thank you for the answer. And uh, one more time, any any questions? Uh, any questions from Dr. Rashidi? So it, it seems that uh, you you had actually. I was sure it, it was a great presentation. Apparently, there there is no question uh, at this point. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rashidi, again for your time today. It was a great pleasure to have you uh, talking about AR for uh, critical care. Uh, we have we will have Dr. Omer Inon from Georgia Tech as our next speaker next month, and he will mainly talk about using uh, signals and sensors uh, for health monitoring. The the signals that usually uh, Dr. Inon's group use are mechanical signals such as seismocardiography. Uh, so. That discussion will be more more around that topic. Again, I, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Parisa Rashidi for her time today. And despite uh, the sickness uh, that she had, uh, she she just accepted to give us this this talk today. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Uh, our meeting today. Thanks very much for inviting me. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for being with us. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.